I don't know if you can hear it, she's sort of wheezing. <laughs> she wheezes when she's tired. Always has, when she was a tiny little puppy. When she was only as big as her head is now, she wheezes when she's tired. I don't know if you can hear that. Oh, well, okay, so you don't need to, you don't need to hear it. And the reason she's really tired, even though it's the middle of the day, is because it's, I think, going to rain. And that just, it does her in. <laughs> she knows when it's gonna, when it's gonna rain, and it makes her endlessly sleepy. <laughs> You're just wheezing on a storm, aren't you, baby? Do you want to go on bed and lay down? <laughs> Hello, BookTube. <laughs> Welcome to your Daily Penguin. This is our tour through my Penguin Classic wall behind me, book by book, author by author, era by era. Uh, we've been hitting a lot of 19th century American literature, one reason or another. But today, not so much. Today we're going way back in time. <laughs> today we're doing a great volume from Penguin Classics. This is edited by Norman Solomon. And it is a selection from the Talmud. <laughs> and uh, and uh, Norman Solomon does a fantastic job here, whittling down 6,000 pages to, what is this, 800? 800 pages. It's an impossible job to do... Uh, a truly representative one volume condensation of of the Talmud, but nevertheless, this is the best version, the best attempt I've ever seen anybody make at it. Uh, and uh, it's going to be difficult to explain <laughs> what this is for those of you who don't know. Of course, you don't need me to explain it. You can Google the term. Just go to Wikipedia and type in Talmud. You'll get a good explanation of the basics of what this is. It's It's... Picture that you've had it, that you're in a job, right? That you've had a job now, especially retail, a retail job. This will work especially right, but any job really. Rem look back on the times when you've had a job and when you've had an, a particularly savage, vicious boss. Maybe if you're in retail, the store manager is the kind of vicious psychopath that, for some weird reason, retail positions tend to attract. Remember your days working for that monster, that, that absolute creature, someone that, that could die and no one would be anything but happy. Their own relatives. No one would be anything but happy if they died. And they, they come to their retail job and realize, okay, as, as the manager of this little retail outlet, I have a tiny amount of power. How can I go about making people miserable? I want to make people miserable with that. That's how I want to use that tiny bit of power, but to make people miserable. How do I go about doing that? And picture that job. And then remember the assistant managers that you often had in situations like that who would wait until the boss was out, wait until the manager was on the day off, the one day off they take a year, <clears> or <throat> was off the site, and would start to say, look, guys, I know, I know, these rules are really dumb. Hey, look, here's a way you can get around it. Here's, here's the minimum that we need. Here's, you know, the good guy managers, the good guy assistant managers. You've probably had those as well. They always work in conjunction with that boss uh, to undermine their psychopathy. Picture the Talmud like that, <laughs> okay? Because the uh, the Jewish Bible, the Old Testament, uh, has a retail boss from hell. It has God. It has Yahweh, who is contradictory, extremely short-tempered, and off-the-chart Richter scale homicidal, <laughs> and who lays down tons and tons of rules that don't make any sense at all, none whatsoever. That that. that if you are the word, the way, and the wonder, if you are the source of all life, light, and, and, and nature, if you moved upon the surface of the deep and created everything that's in it, all the planets, all the stars, all the animals, there is no way you are going to care about how someone harvests corn. No way at all. And yet, lots of rules, <laughs> and all of them punishable, not only by human penalties, but also by God's displeasure. And what the Talmud is, in all of its 6,000 pages, in all of its many, many hundreds of sages coming forward and doing these, writing these long bits, short bits, personal bits, dry and legalistic bits, what the Talmud essentially is, is the writings of those assistant managers. Trying to soften the unblinking, unsleeping, utterly weird tyranny of the boss. <laughs> That's what the Talmud is, essentially. Is it? It's commentaries. Endless, endlessly interesting commentaries on, 
uh, the laws, on the laws of Judaism. Now, that description might lead you to think that this is not interesting, that this book is uh, going to fall into the category that we've encountered in our Daily Penguin many times before, of books that Penguin reprints because they have scholarly interest, but that are not readable. And yet, the Talmud is weirdly readable. You have to get used to it. But if you do get used to it, it is weirdly readable. Watching these different voices weigh in, sometimes separated by centuries, sometimes very creative, uh, sometimes very didactically not creative, watching this chorus of voices just sing throughout this whole book ends up being very mesmerizing. I want to read you a bit that Solomon writes in his introduction, because it's absolutely true. There is no need to start at the first page, since the Talmud is not written in a stepwise fashion. Browse, and you will quite soon find something that attracts you. Something, some amusing anecdote about an incident in the schools. There is far more humor in the Talmud than is generally credited for. Or perhaps some unexpected gem of wisdom. Make that your starting point. Turn over the pages at random to pick up something of the range and rhythm of the Talmud. Wade in, splash about. You may soon discover that you can swim a few strokes. That is absolutely true. You don't to read, need to read this as a book. You want to go through, he takes from the, the various tractates of, of the Talmud in relatively even measure. This, the amazing thing, one of the amazing things about this Penguin Classic is that if you do read the whole thing eventually, you don't have to read it sequentially, but if you do read the whole thing and all of his, foot, his great footnotes and commentary, you will come out of it with a sense of what the unabridged Talmud is actually like. That's a fine achievement on its own. I want to give you a, an example of what I'm talking about here. Uh, uh, the the Mishnah is this. If someone injures another, he is liable under five counts. Injury, pain, medical, idleness, that is loss of earnings, and embarrassment. How do we assess injury? If he blinded someone's eye, cut off his hand, or broke his leg, we view the victim as a slave sold in the market. The court assesses what he would have been worth previously and what he is worth now. How do we assess pain? If he burnt him on a spit, or pierced him with a nail, or even if he pierced a fingernail, where it does not cause a permanent injury, we assess how much a man of that kind would be willing to accept to submit to that much pain. Uh, medical? If he injured him and he was obliged to cure him, if the wound was infected by fungus, and here uh, Solomon tells us that the, the literal translation is if plants grew on it. Uh, if the wound is infected by fungus then if this is the result of the wound, he must pay for treatment. But if not, it is the result of the wound, he is uh, not obliged to pay for treatment. If it healed but reopened repeatedly, he is obliged to pay for treatment. But if it healed completely, he is not obliged to pay for treatment. Idleness? Seeing that he has already been compensated under the first heading for loss of an arm or leg, we assess the injured party as a cucumber guard. <laughs> Meaning that he receives compensation for enforced idleness during his recuperation, but only at the rate for the light work he will be able to do subsequently. Uh, embarrassment? This depends on the status of the one who caused the embarrassment and the one who is embarrassed. <laughs> and then it, we get a little elaboration. Why do we compensate in this way? Surely the Torah says, an eye for an eye. Perhaps it means literally an eye? Don't entertain that thought. <laughs> uh, uh, could it be that if A blinded B's eyes, the court blinds A's eyes? Or if A cuts off B's hand, the court cuts off A's hand? No. This is what scripture says. Who strikes a man, who strikes an animal. Just as one man who, is, who injured an animal pays compensation, so one who injures a man pays compensation. You could also argue that scripture says you may not accept a ransom for the life of a murderer. You may not indeed accept a ransom for the life of a murderer, but you may accept a ransom for the life of one who has caused irreparable loss of limb. Uh, I want to get to... Uh, to uh, yes, okay. Uh, Rabbi Dostai Ben Yehuda says, uh, an eye for an eye. This means monetary compensation. Just plain and simple. And you see, you see kind of what I mean. You can hear the voices of these individual men. They don't all sound the same. Uh, this means monetary compensation. Do you think it means an actual I rather than monetary compensation? Then what would you do if you had, if if one had a large I and one had a small I? <laughs> How could you call that an I for an I, seeing as they are not equal? And it also goes on to say, well, what if you're blind? 
Does that mean you suffer no penalty if you cut someone's eye out? <laughs> and that's what I mean by uh, the kind of mediation that I'm talking about here. Is these people, these learned men, dashing in to humanize these laws and talk about them and argue about them and hair split about them. Like in the case that I mentioned here. If you spend even five minutes reading the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, you will come away with absolutely no doubt in your mind that when the Jewish God, Yahweh, says an eye for an eye, he means scoop out the eyeball. You will come away with no doubt in your mind as to what an eye for an eye means. It is it's barbaric and absolutely literal. Uh, the, the God of the Old Testament is never satisfied unless human blood flows. Never. And the sages who came along later wanted to, med to mediate that. They wanted to, uh, to soften it. They, they come right out and say, this means monetary compensation. This does not mean you scoop out somebody's eye. And so on and so forth. Throughout the whole of this book, you have people arguing about literature. Arguing about things that, uh, readings that they have been schooled in from the time when they were little children, shadowing them, shading them in, elaborating on them endlessly. And it is, it is tremendous fun. I know it doesn't seem it, but once you, once you get into the habit, once you get used to it, it's tremendous fun. <laughs> and I thank, thank the heavens that this penguin volume exists. It, it, I'm just delighted that it's here, that it's here for us. Uh, so, Believe it or not, <laughs> your Penguin Recommend today is a strong recommend. I recommend that you get acquainted with the Talmud. Absolutely I do. Absolutely I do. Because at the heart of all of this hair splitting and double talk and logic chopping, at the heart of all of it, really, when you strip it all away, what you're seeing here is literary interpretation. Agile, mental, literary interpretation. What does this text say? Okay, what does it not say? What implications can we draw from its silences? What implications can we draw from its its illusions or its uh, very soft hints? And that's fascinating. To watch that happen over and over again by some of the most fiercely trained intellectuals of their day is fascinating. There's nothing else quite like it. So, so <laughs> I wanted to recommend it to you. I am recommending to you the Talmud. <laughs> and that is your penguin for today. I don't know where we're going tomorrow. I didn't look. Uh, we'll find out together. <laughs> so I'll wrap this up for now, and I will see you then. Thank you, Booktube.